Welcome to the discussion series on free trade and liberalization as part of the 1991 project at the Mercatus Center. I'm Shruti Rajagopalan, and in this conversation series, I will be talking trade with Professor Arvind Panagarya, who is the director of the Deepak and Neera Raj Center on Indian Economic Policies and the Jagdish Bhagwati Professor of Indian Political Economy at Columbia University. In the past, he has served as the first vice chairman of the Niti Aayog in Government of India and as the chief economist of the Asian Development Bank. He is the author of a number of books, but for today's conversation in particular, we will focus on his recent books, Free Trade and Prosperity and India, the Emerging Giant. Arvind, welcome back. Thank you, Shruti. Glad to be with you. So, Taking off from our previous episode, Arvind, you told us in detail about the import licensing system. Can you walk us through what were the subsequent economic effects of this system, especially the long lasting impact? Excellent, Shruti. This is a very good place to start. The licensing system undermined both the productivity at the firm and industry level and the allocation of resources across industries. The effect was all around. Uh, as regards the productivity at the firm and industry level, there were delays in obtaining imported machinery and inputs. It would take five to seven months uh, for inputs, one and a half years for capital goods and so forth. So that clearly impacted the productivity. There was unproductive use of resources. Uh, you, know, you had a big bureaucracy that had to be created to do the allocation. Entrepreneurs had to line up. Uh, wait uh, outside the offices, uh, wait for products to arrive and so forth. So there was these delays uh, uh, and unproductive use of resources themselves. Then there was inflexibility uh, because of the unused capacity. Uh, you know, uh, if there are not enough inputs that uh, uh, require to be imported but are not allowed to be imported, then the excess capacity uh, arises. Uh, 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 investment goes unused. Um, then there were also rules of thumbs used uh, uh, to make uniform allocations across firms and industries. And you can imagine that that is going to create a lot of inefficiency. Some firms are more productive, others are less productive. Some industries are uh, uh, more capable, others are less capable. Some, uh, and, and you know when you use these, uh, these uh, allocative rules, which are across the board, uh, obviously you are not allocating in the most efficient uh, sort of way. Um, there was also, you know, funny things that happened. Uh, 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 equipment would get imported, but if there are some components in the equipment which uh, have only short life, like you know, in the photography equipment, the bulbs that are required for photography, they have a limited life, they go off. Well, if you don't have the bulbs, the entire equipment becomes unused. So you've got that sort of problem. Uh, so that's one set of things that happened. Then competition, of course, got impacted as well uh, because uh, 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 import competition was automatically shut off if you were going to produce uh, anything domestically. Uh, you know, this was uh, pretty much protection on demand provided. But domestic competition was also strangulated because if you can't get uh, foreign exchange for machinery, then uh, competitor cannot enter the market. So you do that, uh, you, know, you kill that competition as well. And finally, misallocation of resources, uh, because uh, at a broad level, uh, if you look at the uh, you know, uh, uh, full picture, obviously there was a huge anti-export bias created here, uh, both because of nominal exchange rate, uh, because the uh, price levels domestically rose much more, uh, uh, therefore, you know, domestic market obviously becomes more lucrative than the foreign market. Um, uh, real exchange rates uh, uh, appreciates. Um, so all that created a, a, a discrimination against exports as well. Uh, and uh, then it's also in terms of the allocation, uh, efficient and inefficient firms got treated uh, pretty much uh, equally. Uh, so there was no way for uh, more efficient firms to outdo the inefficient ones because they both get equal access to the inputs. And so that yeah. <laughs> clearly allows the uh, inefficient firms to survive as well. Uh, 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 so these are various ways in which, you know, uh, uh, inefficiency is cropped up, productivity is falling, resources being misallocated. 
you know, normally people think that this kind of restrictive import licensing system only impacts imports and, you know, many of the uh, economic effects that you talked about. But it also actually impacts exports and not just in a positive way, but adversely. So can you walk us through how India's restrictive import licensing system actually also impacted India's both exports and therefore the export policy regime? Correct. Uh, so, you know, this is all uh, 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 the, the joint impact of many interventions that, that we were doing. But uh, uh, in, in a very simple sort of way, you see, what happens is that uh, uh, inevitably, when you're restricting imports, uh, that means that uh, you, are, you, you do not need as much for an exchange as, as you would if imports were open. What that does is it causes the uh, domestic currency to appreciate, right? That, that you know, uh, this, this uh, reduces the value of the foreign currency, increases the value of the domestic currency. And, and that's one kind of uh, 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 mechanism through which this happens. Typically import restrictions cause the domestic currency to appreciate in real terms. And of course, an appreciated currency in real terms means that your uh, 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 returns to exports are low uh, and your returns to domestic sales are high. So automatically products get channeled uh, to the domestic sales, domestic markets. Uh, now this got reinforced by the way, uh, uh, by the uh, a very fixed ex nominal exchange rate. This was a time you know, when, when the, the international monetary system had adopted fixed exchange rates, but you know, for the developing countries, it uh, uh, it was it would have been prudent. As for example, you know, South Korea, yeah. uh, in the early 1960s, very quickly undertook very large devaluations of uh, uh, its currency won. And and that actually, you know, because also South Korea didn't have uh, our kind of uh, uh, licensing and the yeah. focus on heavy industries and so forth. So there was internal flexibility as well. So that devaluation really made the exports very lucrative. And very quickly, you know, you see in the early 60s, Korea's light manufacturing exports uh, take off in a very big way. Uh, and, and you see the composition of the export shifting away from agriculture towards these manufacturers. <laughs> but, you know, in our system, uh, uh, we didn't devalue for one thing. Uh, we discussed yeah. earlier the 1958 episode uh, when there was uh, the kind of balance of payments crisis, but we tried to deal with it through this foreign exchange budgeting. Yeah. So, so that clearly put uh, a, a, a break to the to the exchange rate. Uh, and once again, we come to the 60s and all. Also, uh, same issue remains that you know, remember that even if inflation is 5% a year. In 15, in, in 15 years, prices double at home, Yeah. right? And, and if your yeah. exchange rate, nominal exchange rate is fixed, then for a dollar's worth of exports, if you're previously getting, our exchange rate was four rupees 76 paise. So if you're <laughs> getting, you're still continuing to get four, four rupees 76 paise for each yeah. dollar's worth of exports. Yeah. But the domestic prices have doubled, your profitability domestically has doubled. So you sell at home. So you see this, this uh, uh, import restriction automatically turns into uh, an export restriction. In a technical terms, of course, you know, we also have, you would know that this uh, theorem we call the learner symmetry theorem. Yeah. Which effectively this says that, look, if you impose 10% across the board tariff, on every product that will have the effect which is exactly identical to a 10% export tax. Yeah. And, and, and what where this theorem comes from is the fact that you know when you impose this 10% across the board import tariff, you're importing less. 
Well, yeah. then there is a need for export declines correspondingly. So correspondingly, your exports decline also. So basically, there are so many things which are entangled here, but all of it comes down to the principal point of the original problem of an autarkic regime, right? The moment you decide to close yourself up to trade, it becomes very difficult to pick and choose that, you know, these are the areas where we'll participate and benefit from the gains of trade. And these are the areas where, you know, we won't participate and we'll protect us from the problems of trade or competition or something like that. Uh, you, if you if you engage in one, you get the other, right? And and that seems to be the 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 more universal principle. And no matter which country seems to have tried this highly restrictive autarkic regime, they kill their domestic economy exactly because of what you said, you know. And some of this is because of import licensing restrictions. Some of it is because of the way the foreign exchange is pegged. But eventually, the entire system has to make sense. And exports and domestic production seems to be the sacrifice that is made to keep the system intact. Yeah, no, yes. Uh, and, and in our case, of course, it also got entangled by the domestic uh, uh, interventions uh, because the government was trying to also achieve a particular mix of production, yeah. very, you know, focused into heavy industries. Uh, so, so, you know, which could not be competitive for sure. Uh, uh, you know, we just didn't have the comparative advantage in, in, in both industries. Uh, so our cost of production domestically was much higher than what it was of the other producers abroad. Yeah. So we couldn't compete there. Uh, at the same time, uh, you know, uh, uh, where we did have comparative advantages were labor intensive products uh, that we then were forced to kind of push into these cottage industries, uh, very tiny units. So we couldn't compete there either. So, so it, it really kind of uh, 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 interventions at uh, multiple points, uh, uh, and and so uh, and, and at all points, you know, ultimately uh, inefficiencies arose. So, you know, this may be a good point for you to tell us how a country can simultaneously have an anti-export bias, but also have. Uh, export subsidies as a very large part of its, uh, you know, policy program, uh, you know, which benefits uh, certain groups. Now, the two seem antithetical. It doesn't seem reasonable. But in fact, both of them, if I understand correctly from your work, are unintended consequences of the same restrictive import system and the autarkic system. So how do both of these exist at the same time in a country like India in the 50s and 60s? So, yeah, so, so that I think, you know, this is a good point at which we can try to shift a little bit to, to look at the export policy uh, uh, as it was practiced during the 50s and at least, you know, parts of 60s. Um, so, you know, first and foremost, I think, you know, what we need to recognize uh, is the fact that uh, by now we know actually that the exports that suffer, uh, suffered during these years. Uh, yeah. And one kind of measure of that is that uh, India's share in the global economy, uh, which was a little about two and a half percent. Uh, uh, so, so India's exports as a proportion of the total world exports was a little yeah. more than two and a half percent in about 1947. Uh, and uh, by 1966, it had dropped to below 1%, about 0.9%. So yeah. clearly, uh, relative to the global economy, we did very badly in terms of exports. Uh, and, uh, you know, that share never recovered for a very long time. <laughs> even today, I mean, yeah. after 91, we liberalized and all, but even today, our share in the merchandise exports still about 1.7%. So we, we are better than 0.9, but, uh, but we haven't gone back to the 2.5 still. Uh, yeah. Now, large part of it, of course, happened because uh, uh, the exports in the global economy rose much more rapidly. Uh, you know, this is a, these are years, you know, 48 to 1960, uh, the global exports were rising at 7% uh, a year. Uh, India's exports rose only 1.6% a year during uh, that 12-year period. So uh, uh, share net naturally declined. Uh, 
and and that more or less continued into the 60s as well you know 61 to 66 global exports rose 8.2 percent india's rose only 3.4 percent so the share largely kind of declined because i mean it's not like in absolute terms india's yeah. exports were declining uh, but uh, they were declining relative to the uh, for all exports uh, and by the way that poor performance of exports uh, evidently fed back into the import policy because then you don't have foreign exchange, you got fixed exchange rate. Um, only way you can then deal with your balance of payments is through restricting imports. So that was uh, the feedback that was happening. Now, uh, uh, on the export side, you know, in the 50s actually, uh, we need not only uh, were actually uh, indifferent toward, uh, towards exports. You know, the attitude generally was one of indifference. If you look at all the debates that happened in the uh, uh, in 1955, you know, around the, the second five-year plan, Melano basis model, uh, all that, you know, there's basically a, a, an attitude of benign neglect. Nobody is paying any attention. The assumption is, that we are an autarkic economy, that we there is no trade. Even Melanobi's model itself yeah, it strictly assumes that the economy is completely closed. So that was, but actually, in terms of policy-wise, we did even worse because uh, uh, it was not pure benign neglect. It was actually one of uh, uh, abuse of, of export policy because we actually imposed restrictions, both physical restrictions on exports and we used export taxes. Now here, there's a, you know, the, the, this book that everybody refers to by uh, Dr. Manmohan Singh, our uh, former prime minister and, and, uh, and, and also uh, the finance minister from 91 to 96. Um, he had written his PhD thesis on India's exports uh, in 1962 uh, 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 at Cambridge, which later on, up came out in 1964 as a book. Uh, and it's very, very nice analysis. It, he doesn't talk much or almost, he doesn't talk at all about the imports, uh, only focuses on the exports. So the book's title also is, uh, reflects that, you know, I have it here, uh, it's, it's titled as India's Export Trends. Uh, so he, he only talks about exports, but there he documents that, you know, uh, 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 most of our exports were really traditional. Uh, uh, things like um, uh, uh, jute manufacturers, uh, tea, cotton piece goods, um, iron ore, manganese ore, uh, largely, you know, uh, uh, very, very little uh, of manufacturers, only cotton, you know, that was our uh, longstanding industry, which, which had acquired some efficiency and, and so it had acquired export markets. But we were neglecting it at the time, but you know, it's still because of its history was, was surviving. Uh, now, you know, what we did, however, during this period was also to use uh, uh, these export restrictions. And Man Dr. Manon Singh really describes that, look, this is, this is uh, even the medium run, this is self-defeating. Because when you, even when you have very large share, what happens is that when you restrict, it opens the door to the competitors, yeah. Compa you know, because obviously when you restrict, you are using your market power to raise the price at which price that you can get for your exports. Yeah. Right. I mean, this is what a monopolist always does. But that rise in the price also serves as an incentive to other competitors who were previously inefficient, but yeah. now they are able to compete. So they enter the market. And so, you know, within a few years, they beat you. <laughs> and and uh, likewise, he said, export taxes have a kind of similar kind of impact. Same thing, you know, if you have export taxes are also restricting exports. Uh, countries also, the importing countries, when they are faced with, you know, restrictions on uh, uh, exports by the exporting country, they begin to look for alternatives. Yeah. So the, both ways, they look for alternative suppliers of the same product, but they also begin looking for substitute products. Yeah. Right. So, you know, eventually plastics, et cetera, came to replace the uh, uh, jute manufacturers, right? I mean, you know, uh, yeah. a lot of the things on which, for which jute was being used, uh, then plastic bags came in and they replaced. So, so 
So there are these substitutes that come in. So there's a very nice rendition of this in, in, in his book saying that, look, you know, these export restrictions are self-defeating harmful. So because of this, by early 60s, we began to see that there's a problem in, on the export side, export, uh, exports are declining, something needs to be done. So what do we do? Well, we go back and introduce export subsidies to some products, but that also what we are trying to yeah. do is particularly things like chemicals and engineering goods. That is what we are, you know, so we say, well, we are, this yeah. is what we are going to, you know, uh, uh, this is what we want to export. And of, of course, you know, with high enough subsidy, you can become an exporter of the products uh, uh, to some degree. Uh, and so engineering goods did begin to emerge as, as, export, uh, as export items. But actually, if you look at the full, uh, you know, uh, composition of exports, even till, as late as 1965-66, your traditional exports, three, top three, jute manufacturers was your top export, tea was the next, and then cotton piece goods. So these are clothing, etc. Yeah. you know. Uh, and probably they also include the fabrics. Uh, I mean, you know, in the Indian uh, yeah. uh, 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 classification, we often also, in the past, used to club both clothing and and and, and other textiles in, into the one category. So, if you take those three, they accounted for more than fifty percent of the exports uh, till at least uh, 60, 61. Uh, even as you get to sixty five, sixty six, when the engineering goods have begun to emerge, um, you, uh, you you have almost like about uh, over forty percent of the products. Uh, forty percent of the exports are accounted for by these three. The traditional ones so so the subsidies in the end you know and and so subsidy export subsidies in the end you know could only do so much ultimately the nominal exchange rate was so overvalued that you know and in some cases these subsidies were very large uh, 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 bhagwati and desai book uh, gives you you know the estimate you know yeah. uh, what what these subsidies were as a proportion of the price of the product and in some cases, these, <laughs> the, these subsidies really rise well above 50%, uh, which, which is not surprising given the fact that, yeah. you know, the nominal exchange rate was so, so, so uh, was fixed and therefore the real exchange rate was so, so overvalued. So, uh, you know, various kinds of instruments were, uh, uh, so, you know, some, uh, uh, but what happened over this time, you know, that in the world market, we lost share. I mean, yeah. we thought that we will, you know, uh, but even in value terms, Right, because you're trying to like things like do twenty. You're trying to get market power, right? So if market power is effective, at least in value terms, your export share should be rising. But it actually fell. Uh, so you know, in jute, we went from something like eighty six percent in nineteen fifty one to seventy three percent by nineteen sixty. In tea, we had almost forty nine percent, around forty eight to fifty, fell to forty three percent, fifty eight to sixty. So, you know, the shares actually, even where we were so large, shrink, began to shrink. Uh, cotton textiles also, we lost the, the, the market. So, something interesting is also going on in the rest of the world, right? So, one is, of course, as you talk about, the, our shares are declining as a, as a share of global trade. Uh, but the size of global trade itself is increasing in post-war years, right? So post-war, the developed countries see for maybe two and a half to three decades, the longest, you know, peacetime growth that has probably ever been seen in history. So those countries are growing. Uh, now, a lot of the goods that were diverted in terms of demand for war goods, right? And I can imagine jute being one of those, uh, you know, between between the two world wars and in the immediate post-colonial period, I can imagine a lot of packaging material, moving material uh, being a requirement. But you see that after 1950 in the developed world, most of the trade starts shifting more and more towards demand for consumed goods, which is something India is simply not making, whether it is for its domestic consumers or for people abroad, right? It is still very much going along as if you know, there's a colonial government extracting, you know, iron ore and manganese ore, or, you know, if you're basically sending out raw materials or tea. It just hasn't somehow adapted to the to where the new world is going and what people seem to want to spend their money on. Yeah, 
No, this was kind of foretold, right? Because the other development literature is telling you that you know primary products have these low uh, income and price elasticities. Uh, that as incomes rise there, uh, yeah. the demand will automatically shift towards manufacturers, largely these consumer goods. Uh, but also uh, 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 price elasticity uh, is high on those products, but very yeah. low on these traditional uh, primary products. So if, even if you try to export a lot, and this is where, you know, Jagdish Bhagwati's famous paper on MS rising growth comes in. Exactly. Right, saying that, you know, even if you raise productivity, even if you do investments and you try to export a lot more of these primary products, uh, the price will drop so much. And we, by the way, also face it today. We are yeah. in agriculture continuously trying to raise the output. But, yeah. you know, where, where can you sell this agricultural output? Price elasticity is extremely low. So at yeah. the end of the day, you can't do a whole lot of good by raising the output of these food grains, et cetera, through MSP. You raise the price, uh, I mean, you, you raise the output uh, through MSP, yeah. but in the market, the price will drop. So, you know, for, for those who have farmers who have to sell their product produce in the market, basically will be wiped out. So yeah. <laughs> it, it, it is, uh, uh, you know, uh, 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 and what we were doing was, you know, trying to go into heavy industry where we could not succeed in the global marketplace. Yeah. Uh, and so therefore, and, and we haven't got the consumer goods manufacturers where South Korea, Taiwan, Singapore are succeeding big time, Hong Kong, they're all succeeding big time, you know, in the 60s. Uh, uh, but we are not because, you know, that's, those are not the products we are doing. Uh, so, uh, very much self-defeating, uh, but you know, at the time, I mean, now this is all hindsight. We can go back and do the analysis. But at the time, there was no, you know, this this uh, uh, preoccupation that we are going to be powerhouses of engineering goods and chemical and uh, products and so forth uh, is is so strong at the time. You know, this uh, uh, that uh, uh, nobody is thinking actually of the light manufacturers in India. Uh, you know. Uh, um, even when this, it comes to subsidies, it's not the uh, uh, export subsidies. It's not the uh, uh, clothing and, and, and the textiles that are getting the subsidy. It's engineering goods and chemical products which are uh, getting, getting the subsidy. Uh, but, you know, very limited success. Uh, and, and that, of course, uh, uh, eventually gets us into a problem. Uh, you know, uh, you would remember, you know, the... Uh, the uh, uh, crisis, balance of payments crisis that we had yeah. uh, finally in, in the mid 60s. That's actually a good, you know, this is uh, the first balance of payments crisis we spoke about last time, you know, this was going on in 1958, which led to this foreign exchange budgeting sort of system. Now, the crisis in the mid 60s is a little bit different. So first, can you just walk us through what led to this balance of payments crisis in the 60s? Yeah, certainly. So look, you know, first of all, we might want to ask a question here that could things have been different, right? I mean, um, yeah. uh, you know, uh, as I mentioned, uh, um, Dr. Manmohan Singh's book really did recommend that uh, uh, evaluation. And he then said, look, you know, there, there was a lot of concern still because, uh, uh, and to be fair, in the academic literature, there was a lot of this elasticity pessimism, uh, yeah. which was that, you know, if you devalue, if, if you have a lot of market power in, certain, in, in products, which arguably was there in, in the Indian case in, in things like jute and uh, tea, et cetera, uh, then your terms of trade in those products will really get worse, right? That, that you know, when you devalue, uh, 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 say, exchange rate goes from five rupees to eight rupees per dollar, uh, that will create an incentive for these exporters to export more. Uh, 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 and that will simply, because of the low demand elasticity, uh, depress the prices. So he said that, okay, you know, where in whatever commodities you have that problem, uh, put a modest export tax, uh, yeah. but otherwise you devalue and you don't need to do any subsidies. That was his recommendation. Largely kind of thing did happen later in 66, uh, in 1966, uh, we'll come to that. Uh, but, but a good question at this point is that, you know, suppose this devaluation had been done earlier or something, you know, could things have been very different. Uh, and my kind of conclusion here is that, you know, 
some difference we could have made and I, i've said before that you know 1958 was a good time at that time could have changed but unless we were willing to change the industrial structure itself unless we were willing to go back to kind of doing consumer goods industries uh, light manufacturers and move away from this heavy industry approach uh, in the end we couldn't have succeeded uh, yeah. you know so so the so the failure as we will discuss in 1966 uh, uh, to to it to some degree was related to the fact that you know ultimately we were not willing to change the uh, industry structure uh, if industry structure remains in in, in, in that, that you are trying to go into products in which you don't have a comparative advantage then this problem the, the fundamental problem really remains uh, that that your production structure is out of whack with your endowment factor endowment uh, you know you are a very labor abundant country but you are trying to do highly capital intensive industries and and that kind of always creates a tension so in a big way we couldn't have solved the problem and and as you can see you know we are still struggling yeah. with that problem after 30 years of reforms we are yeah. we are still st- struggling to, uh, uh, with with that problem but and this know, is why you know ultimately to me- but that seems to me not just a problem of uh, you know import policy or export policy or industrial policy as specifics that to me seems a problem of the government simply cannot have such a large imprint on the economic system because it won't be able to calculate effectively uh, and mimic what the market would do in terms of sending resources to their highest productive use so the problem is even more fundamental right like what you're saying is not only is there no simple fix and it has to fix the way it looks at industry i would take two back two steps back and say it has to relook entirely at the way it thinks about the economy and the way it thinks about people and whether a mixed economic system under socialist planning with the planning commission is actually the correct way to go or they just need to abandon that wholesale right but this is all connected this is all connected that you know if you are willing to except that look you know my comparative advantage is in labor intensive industries and i should let the structure shift back to towards those industries then what you are saying will follow i mean this is where you know bhagwati in the site 1970 book says that look you know you did not need to have this licensing across the board on everything and you did not need to have these import controls uh, through licensing is it you know use tariffs uh, if if you wish to on 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 import but otherwise let them come in use the exchange rate uh, and and if there are certain products which are absolutely desirable for the economy to produce just do some bit of investment licensing on those products and leave the rest free don't you know so so that you know and, and in fact so if you think if you really look at that book uh, it's very much written during the political That's economy true. context of the time it's not they're not saying that you know let the markets rip or something you know <laughs> it's not the, it is yeah. not written at all in that kind of spirit uh, they, they they see the political economy and so forth uh, and, and so so what you are saying is it, roughly what what bhagwati and desai book kind, kind of says that look you know this intervention anywhere and everywhere is 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 the problem so if if there was a willingness to let the industry structure shift towards consumer goods then what you are saying in terms of reduce interventions in the system would have followed i mean then you would not have needed to you know plan every single industry in that way yeah i mean you're you're precisely trying to produce things that market will not tell you to produce which yeah. forces then your hand to 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 uh, to impose investment licensing so yeah no no so, and so now yeah. that you know the systemic solution was not a possibility and that was simply not at the time being discussed as something to be done like you know even globally uh, uh, even within india though there were specific suggestions like the one dr manmohan singh gave uh, of course uh, you know uh, in later years bhagwati and desai come come up with a much much clearer stronger critique of the system but at the time of say the early 60s other than devaluation you know what were the possibilities and second what actually was the crisis that led to a point of devaluation that had to be done in 66 
what was going on then? Right. Yeah, you see, so now by 60s, what of dissatisfaction emerges from the industry? Because you see, 50s was easier period. Number one, foreign exchange control was not there, you know, till 58 at least. Um, licensing system, uh, you know, the bureaucracy could still deal with it because relatively yeah. few projects, capital was limited anyway. So, uh, you know, and the signals went out that look, you know, chemical industry is what the government is trying to develop, uh, heavy industries, um, uh, steel, etc. So, Industrialists also know what to apply for uh, in terms of the license uh, and things have. But after this foreign exchange budgeting was adopted, then the system became, began, to become, began to become complex. And by 60s, 63, 64, you begin to see a proliferation of these committees, you know, about licensing, right, what to yeah. do, you know, because big backlog comes in. Also, the economy has grown a little larger. So more applications are coming. Uh, and uh, the numbers, are, some of these numbers are given in my book, India, the Emerging Giant. Yeah. Uh, uh, you know, the license applications uh, uh, rise in, in numbers and all. Um, and the uh, bureaucracy is not able to deal with it, at least expeditiously. So delays become endemic. And that leads the government to appoint a number of countries. There was a Swaminathan committee, there was a Zari committee, there was four or five of these committees, the reports coming. But the tragedy, of course, is that none of those reports is saying do away with licensing or do away yeah. with substantial part of licensing, mm -hmm. uh, you know, put licensing in certain sectors and leave the rest. They are not saying that. They're just focusing on how I can improve the processes so that the licensing can, uh, uh, licenses can be issued more rapidly. So these <laughs> committee reports all kind of focus on, and they, you know, Painstakingly, uh, uh, even uh, re uh, uh, record all the all the delays that are happening and all. You know, so you could, in Bhagwati and Desai book reports many of these. Uh, 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 you know, in what sector, what how much delay was happening and how much of it was happening where, how was you know. So it's all documented now. Uh, you know, but but the point was that the system was not thinking in terms of giving up uh, the, the 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 basic structure, uh, either in terms of production or in terms of the policy regime. This is not willing to give that up. And so the crisis began, kept growing up. So number of things happened, you know, number of things happened. First of all, you know, uh, the agricultural performance, which was kind of at least flat uh, uh, from 60, 61 to 63, 64. These are the first four years of the 1960s. But then, there was then a bumper crop for one year, 64, 65. After which, you know, there was drought. There were two back-to-back -back big droughts, 65, 66, 66, 67. So that, uh, those droughts actually plays a very, play a very critical role. You know, 60, uh, 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 5, 66 drought particularly, uh, you know. Uh, and, and so remember this, uh, 65, 66, financial year is fully ending at the end of March, 1966. Yeah. And the devaluation happened in June, 1966. So, so this this uh, uh, drought really uh, played a very important role because trade being so little, uh, the industrial economy was also very tied into the agricultural economy. And so the, the drought automatically impacted the industrial economy also. Side alongside the export performance was was getting worse and worse. Uh, in terms of the, uh, you know, uh, the, the proportion of exports in GDP, that was 3.7% in 1966-61, already low, but it fell to 2.9% by 65-66. Yeah. So exports, your export revenues are declining badly. Rising public expenditures were being financed by foreign borrowing and money creation. So you're borrowing abroad, your debt servicing ratios are rising. You know, exports, a large part of the exports is being taken away by uh, debt servicing, the interest and principal that you have to pay back. Um, and exports themselves are declining. You know, they fall to 2.9% of the GDP by 65, 66. So that puts the pressure. Then partly you're doing money creation. Money creation is raising domestic prices. Yeah. So again, domestic market, domestic uh, uh, market is becoming more lucrative. 
So you want to stay away from exports, sell in the domestic market. Um, so, uh, 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 you know, public uh, uh, investment was rising here as well. Uh, you know, it rose 11.2% annually from 61, 62 to 65, 66. And by 1965-66, public fixed investment alone was uh, close to 10% of the GDP, very large. You know, the public sector is, is, was taking, sucking up these resources um, uh, and, and current expenditures were rising uh, of the government. Uh, 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 China war happened, which led to the, the, uh, the, the defense expenditures to rise. You know, I mean, uh, it, it's, uh, it's unthinkable today to, to get to that level, but uh, it was, used to be 2% of GDP in 1961, became 4% by 1965 66. Okay. So today we are still not at 4%, you know, we are well below. Um, so consolidated fiscal deficit rose from 5.6% of GDP in 6061 to 6.7% in 65 66. Um, loans abroad, even exclude your PL 480, that was kind of like A. Yeah, that's so a. even excluding that, Yes, uh, yeah, so excluding that the loans that you were taking up, uh, borrowing abroad uh, increased from 1.4% of GDP in 6061 to 2.4% uh, in 6566. That service ratio, this is what I mentioned, you know, exports as a proportion, sorry, the, the debt service, meaning interest in principal paid on foreign debt as a proportion of your total export earnings were already 21% uh, in 6667. Yeah. Now, you know, one fifth of such small export earnings are being taken away there. What do you do for imports? So you're clearly moving. This is exactly the kind of thing that was happening, you know, very similar uh, in 90, which led to 91 balance of payments crisis. So it was yeah. very classic kind of, you know, the, uh, balance of payments crisis that you observe uh, with fixed exchange rate systems, uh, or, or which don't respond by devaluation and continue to domestically inflate the economy. I mean, yeah. this is a, a perfect kind of uh, medicine for, or, or you can call it poison, if you yeah. wish, uh, uh, for the balance of payments crisis. So, so the, and, 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 you know, this was being seen and, and uh, you remember I mean, the, uh, the, all the episodes about India having to live ship to mouth uh, policy yeah. of uh, uh, Lyndon B. Johnson uh, uh, at that time. Uh, and, and so the US is also getting impatient uh, and, and it's got some power because India is a big problem. You know, it has to uh, get the food grade from him. So, uh, so they, they, so, so they were seeing that the crisis is brewing, and the U.S. was very kind of also uh, by this time realizing that heavy industry was the wrong thing to do. So it wanted India to pay much greater attention to agriculture, uh, and so it got the World Bank to to come in here, uh, and uh, in nineteen in September sixty four. Uh, uh, the Aid India Consortium, uh, uh, you know, was very alarmed, and they appointed this man called Bernard Bell. Yeah, uh, the Bell uh, Mission. Uh, uh, you know, the Bell Mission. <laughs> uh, uh, so they came, uh, studied on, you know, from the World Bank. Uh, they studied the situation and asked, as asked, they made policy recommendations. Uh, and so they went and said, "Look, you know, you have to shift away from heavy industry to agriculture." Uh, uh, and of course, a very integral part of their package was just the evaluation of the rupee. Uh, and they also said, you know, put an end to licensing uh, of imports uh, of at least intermediate yeah. inputs. So they said you can keep the licensing on the on the capital goods and and consumer goods, uh, but but intermediate inputs and sensible because you know if you've got this capacity that is under un unutilized. Uh, it makes because you're not allowing enough in, intermediate inputs to be imported. Uh, that's a loss to the economy. So, uh, in principle, this is the correct uh, correct kind of recommendation. Uh, 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 they but then a part of the package was also a substantial non-project aid for maintenance imports. Now, uh, part of the failure also happened, by the way, because that aid actually never came. Yeah. And, uh, 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 you know, uh, Vijay Joshi and Ian Little wrote a, a thick book on, in 1994 on India's macro, where they cover this crisis in, in great detail. Uh, it's a very yeah. nice history, actually, of, of yeah. India's macroeconomy up, up to about 91. 
uh, and, and the, the reforms and post 91, they pick up in the next book that they wrote together. Uh, that was a shorter book. But, but uh, uh, that book, they said that uh, according to uh, uh, their sources, the government of India was expecting about $900 million uh, uh, of uh, uh, non-project aid uh, for maintenance imports for several years. Yeah. But that never materialized. And that really infuriated uh, the Indian government. And this is why they then uh, uh, also felt free to reverse some of the uh, measures that they had initially taken at the recommendation of uh, uh, the Bell Commission. So Bell Commission so, also had said, you know, uh, put an end to export subsidies yeah. uh, and to import licensing on intermediate inputs and then substantial devaluation. Sorry, go ahead. No, so, you know, absolutely. And in, in our 1991 project, you know, my colleague Prakhar Mishra, he has done a really detailed timeline of the 1966 devaluation. It's almost sort of like mm -hmm. a mirror, right? The, the crisis is very similar to the one yeah. in 1991, what happened in 1966, but not with the same results. So he has a lovely paper and, you know, the book that you're talking about, uh, the, the Vijay Joshi book, we featured it on our website and our newsletter and so on. Uh, so, you know, everyone can, we'll, we'll put in a link and, and everyone can refer to it. but I want to also go back to the political situation within India, including sort of, you know, the, the liberal voices, technical voices of economists and so on. When there was an attempt to devalue the rupee in 1966, uh, most politicians, uh, especially, you know, important members in the cabinet, they were actually against it. Of course, you know, the most staunch uh, uh, opposer of this was uh, T.T. Krishnamachari. Uh, but you know, there were a lot of people who were who were against the move. And even staunch liberals like from the Swatantra Party were not particularly in favor. And uh, so what were the conditions under which this devaluation was implemented, though it was not exactly supported by the politics of the day? Yeah, so this was, there was no alternative, you know, this, you could say the Tina factor at work here. Yeah. <laughs> Uh, because uh, uh, at the end of the day, uh, uh, you know, India was at this time very dependent on food imports from the United States. I, I think that was very critical uh, um, factor in, in the whole thing. Uh, and the U.S. Uh, clearly wanted this shift to happen, uh, both towards agriculture and towards a more liberal regime and a movement away from this heavy industry. Uh, now, by the way, U.S. was also playing a very similar, had played a very similar role earlier in South Korea. Yeah. Uh, you know, South Korea also, uh, uh, when they wrote their first plan in early 1960s, <laughs> there was some bit of uh, 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 shift, proposals for a shift uh, to heavy industry in, in South Korea. It never happened, but US also was kind of advising them uh, against that and, and US. Uh, so, so there was some bit of that earlier, although uh, in fairness, you know, as far as India was concerned, uh, at that time, they were giving aid to India <laughs> without saying that, you know, the heavy industry is not the way to go. They, they actually supported uh, at that time. And so, it, so it's, not, uh, it's not the case that uh, 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 their opposition to heavy industry in India had been there before. This is much later, you know. Uh, yeah. uh, uh, so... Uh, but anyway, you know, I, I think politically, you are absolutely right that there was no consequence whatsoever uh, in, in, in favor of devaluation. And I doubt actually, you know, that Manmohan Singh by that time was within the system, so we don't know. But uh, what his view was, I mean, in a way, he has never said anything, at least to my knowledge, uh, as to where, uh, uh, although his book clearly was, was uh, quite uh, favorable. So I would imagine that, that at least internally, uh, he was uh, voicing uh, support for devaluation. But, you know, politically, nothing, you know, right? Because they had to bring, uh, Sachin Chaudhary was, uh, was brought in, right, at the time. Uh, and he did the devaluation because TTK wouldn't uh, 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 go along with it. Um, uh, 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 and a and lot of, you know, opposition was there. Now, in, again, to be fair, uh, one must also acknowledge the fact that Economists were not <laughs> in favor either. You know, it's not like economists were in any way uh, supporting it. I mean, you know, Jagdish Bhagwati certainly spoke positively, and I think Mrs. Gandhi did consult him. 
uh, so he did, uh, and, and, and certainly he was supportive. Uh, but the fact is that, uh, that uh, political support was simply not there. Uh, and, and economists were at that time very much into this elasticity pessimism, that devaluation, mm -hmm. because the exports are so price inelastic, devaluation might end up hurting rather than helping. Right? There's a lot mm -hmm. of that academic literature from that period that when is devaluation effective? And we learned all about these Marshall Lerner conditions, right? That, you know, some of the uh, uh, import elasticity should be bigger than one uh, for, for the, uh, <laughs> uh, for, for the uh, devaluation to be effective. And, and, and we felt that our uh, products that we were actually exporting were not so price elastic and also therefore uh, will not get the balance of payments improvement. So, to some degree, the economics was also helping the political uh, class, which was opposed to it. And above all, I think, you know, in India, this was really seen as externally imposed on India. Yeah. And, and that never goes well in India. You know, anything that is seen as externally imposed, uh, it simply gets rejected by the public. Yeah. Uh, and this is why, you know, 1991 uh, reform was sold very carefully as India's own decision. A homegrown, yeah. Uh, own, homegrown and that, you know, this was India's decision, not, uh, uh, and even in the way uh, 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 it, it was handled with the IMF and the World Bank was that, you know, yeah. we would send from our side the letter that this is our plan, this is what we plan to do. Yeah. Right? <laughs> and, and it's as though this is what we do, plan to do ourselves. If it fits into yours, then you give us uh, the, the, the assistance. Uh, but, you know, so it's as if chronologically we are the ones uh, taking the action, not uh, rather than the IMF saying that if you do this, then we will, you know. So so it was, uh, yeah. but but 66 was very clear. Bell, Bell mission had come in, uh, report was given, and the, 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 the recommendation came clearly from outside. And also credit where credit is due to Prime Minister Indra Gandhi right uh, in a in a sea of opinion where almost everyone was against the move uh, she was the one who had to you know decide whether or not they're going ahead with the devaluation and you know she was in favor uh, i believe there was a meeting uh, between uh, professor jagdish bhagwati and prime minister indira gandhi and also kn raj was consulted uh, and apparently, Professor Bhagwati gave details on, you know, not only must India devalue, but how much it should devalue. Are you privy to the details of this discussion at all? No, I don't think the discussion was there. I doubt it. Uh, uh, discussion was more about, you know, she was asking, uh, what do you think will happen? Do you think this, this will get the export response? Uh, that's my recollection uh, uh, from conversations with Jagdish. Um, but I should check back with you. you know, one of the thing, things uh, uh, he, he always says while telling this story is that Mrs. Gandhi, you know, had the habit of uh, uh, keeping her head down, asking questions, and then doodling in on her <laughs> you <know>, writing pad. <laughs> but uh, uh, but my recollection generally is that she she was trying to feel out, you know, what what the impact will be. Uh, okay. Which was not easily predictable, frankly speaking. You know, so so, uh, but, but yeah. we can check. I, I'll check. That must be such a nice thing to have to to pop into the next office and ask Professor Bhagwati exactly what happened in 1966, <laughs> uh, which is lovely. But you know, it's again when we look back at that story, it's the usual suspects, right? It's B. R. Shanoi and T. N. Trinivas and Jagdish Bhagwati who've written extensively about this episode of devaluation before and after. Uh, but aside from that, you're right. You know, the general view of the economists is not in support. The general view of the politicians is not in support. It seems to be some compromise, you know, sort of like a Tina factor, which this, this whole devaluation is pushed through. But one of, is this perhaps the reason that after the devaluation, the sort of liberalization one would have expected never really happened in India in 1966? Like in 1991, after the, the two-step devaluation in early July, there were a series of trade reforms and industrial licensing reforms and so on that were announced. This was that opportunity for India in the mid-60s, but it never quite worked out. You see, the, the problem 
is 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 uh, you know uh, there are multiple problems here why why it could not have worked out uh, first and foremost again are we willing to let the industry structure be determined a lot more by the market forces yeah I mean, that was the most crucial thing uh, without that there was no play you know i mean you will run into the same problems going forward you know so so yeah. either you continuously uh, keep tightening your import uh, uh, regime so that your balance of payments remain uh, uh, manageable uh, or the other alternative is to actually you know let go of the uh, investment licensing let the market decide what the people want for what are the products for which the actual demand exists uh, without that i don't think you could have succeeded you see this is why i also think that uh, 91 reform uh lip trade liberalization uh, could not have succeeded unless we had you know because we also gave up all the licensing and uh, investment licensing at that time yeah so there were multiple steps got taken which were essential but if we were not prepared to do that uh, no there was an extra problem actually in this in, in the mid 60s which is the exchange rate you yeah. to be prepared to devalue more uh, and shenoy as, as you know actually has written that uh, that that in his view the failure was because the devaluation was too little uh, a, a, a much larger devaluation was needed and i think he's right because yeah. just think about it the exchange rate nominal exchange rate had been fixed since what 48 or 49 somewhere yeah. there Had four rupees seventy six paise per dollar until nineteen sixty six. You got practically almost you know eighteen nineteen year period. Yeah. And if if your prices have more than doubled during that period domestically, and similar inflation has not happened abroad. Yeah. Then you 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 have to you know devalue by much larger. Uh, 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 volume, you know, you have to go to something like at least ten, eleven, twelve rupees to the dollar. We went to only seven point five rupees to the dollar. Yeah. So, so I sort of broadly speaking, I, I agree with Shanoi's analysis that the devaluation itself was was too little. But then I think Bhagwati and Srinivasan also point out that you know, so this was like uh, in terms of the value of the rupee in terms of the dollar. fell by uh, devaluation meant that the value declined by 36 and a half percent that was the extent of devaluation uh, uh, value of rupee in terms you know when you do the calculation going from 4.676 rupees to the dollar to 7.5 rupees to the dollar that is a decline of 36 and a half percent of uh, uh, rupees value in terms of the dollar uh, but the actual the valuation was even less because many of the export subsidies uh yeah. were cut out and import tariffs uh, or import premium got reduced yeah right so both of those factors also contributed to the devaluation being less than this uh, 36 and 1/2% uh, uh, you know so actually bhagwati and besai they they give a calculation uh and and they say that effective devaluation uh, turned out to be only 17 and a half percent for exports because you know the, if you were uh, uh, getting you know previously uh, for each dollars worth of exports you are getting some subsidies also which got taken out so now for dollars worth you are actually getting uh 7 and a half rupees instead of 4.76 rupees but then on top whatever export subsidy you were getting on 4.76 rupees let's say another 2 rupees if that's taken out then on net you have not got 7 and a half rupees uh, you know the difference between 7 yeah. and a half rupees to 4 uh, rupees 76 paise uh, uh, 2 2 2 rupees in between have also gone away so so whatever uh, the, the extra is much less that is their point that so you know the actual devaluation for exports on average was only 7 and 7.17.8% instead of 36.5% and for imports it was 29.7% 
instead of 36 and a half percent. So Chennai would say that you needed, you know, anyway, much more uh, uh, yeah. devaluation, much larger. But what you got actually was not even 36 and a half percent. So it was it was insufficient. Then the two back to back droughts yeah. further complicated this, right? Because June 66, uh, the devaluation happens, but the drought is continuing. The entire year 66, 67, which means still March of 67, this drought is continuing. And so the prices are rising. Domestic prices yeah. are rising. And that rising domestic prices is further undermining the, the uh, uh, devaluation, meaning you know the domestic goods are becoming more lucrative now, uh, uh, even within a year of this. So it was a kind of, you could say that it was a death foretold, meaning, you know, that uh, you, you, you could have uh, expected that this is, this is how it will turn out. Uh, at least well, that's how it looks in, in hindsight, you know. Um, and, and in, you know, the, the immediate aftermath, the cash subsidies, the import replenishments, all of these were brought back, reducing, you know, the effective devaluation. But how does this inform what is the trade policy that will follow? So, you know, you've devalued, you've obviously not devalued sufficiently. Now, what is a good way to think about how the policymakers at that time were thinking about trade policy post devaluation without implementing any liberalization reforms? Right. So, so now, you know, they begin to see the failure, right? So, uh, <laughs> which is the, that the exports have not responded. Now, it's not failure per se, actually, because it's failure because exports don't do better. But that doesn't mean devaluation failed because exports would have done even worse. That's but true. you know, that counterfactual nobody looks at. Nobody worries about yeah. the counterfactual. You only look at, well, you know, here is, uh, here is what were the exports before. And here are what the exports are after. And you say, oh, devaluation has failed. But of course, if we had not devalued, the crisis would have been even bigger. So, so devaluation didn't quite fail, but it's simply that you know, it did not deliver the uh, the, the the outcome that was that we needed, and that yeah. was because not because the uh, devaluation failed, but because devaluation was not large enough. Yeah. Uh, and, and you know, this withdrawal of export subsidies and import tariffs further undermined the effectiveness of the devaluation. So. That's what exactly what happened, which of course meant that any support that uh, the, that uh, Bell package, Bell mission package had disappeared very quickly. Yeah. Uh, and so export subsidies did return as you just mentioned. Uh, 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 so, so we did not continue on the path to liberalization because you know, they said, well, you know, what do we do? We got to now do something else to get yeah. more exports. Yeah. <laughs> and so uh, uh, export subsidies do come back uh, in, by 1970, 71, the import controls were back in full swing uh, yeah. uh, and even more stringent, even more stringent uh, than, uh, than uh, they were prior to devaluation. So this is, you know, this is the conclusion of Toshi and Little uh, who, yeah. who uh, say that, look, you know, import controls uh, by 70, 71 were far more stringent now than they were even before. Uh, in terms of its implementation. Uh, and uh, Bhagwati and Srinivasan kind of uh, uh, say that the combined export subsidy uh, as a result of these measures on some selected items, including engineering goods, chemical plastics, and other new products. Uh, so they give these numbers uh, 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 say that they were ranged something like between 50 to 90% uh, uh, on the effective ad valorem basis. So, it was very large, you know. It was on yeah. selected items, of course. You know, they were trying to subsidize. Uh, 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 you know, traditional ones. They would always, you know, uh, uh, elasticity pessimism always uh, uh, kept them more on the side of restraining the exports rather than uh, stimulating. But on uh, products like sports goods, paper products, processed foods, they tried to give subsidies, and and these were between fifty to ninety percent uh, of the effective ad valorem. Uh, value of the of the products so that's that's where we came back 
And you know, at the same time, uh, earlier you had talked about how until there was a shift in industrial policy at home, uh, there's only so much that all this devaluation and you know the external sector reforms can can work out or succeed. And what you see after 1967 is uh, Mrs. Gandhi's government is now doubling down on socialism at home in a whole new way. Right. So it's doubling down on heavy industry. They're talking about commanding heights of the Indian economy. They're nationalizing general insurance. They're nationalizing coal mines, copper mines. Uh, you know, there is there is a big wave further cementing India's heavy industry policy, uh, which is at play simultaneously because of, you know, all the union problems. There are hundreds of cotton textile mills which are now going broke. Uh, and not allowed to exit, right? So at that time, you have all these, you know, sick textile mills, um, you know, legislation which is passed. These are all nationalized by the government. The mills become defunct. So there is that problem going on simultaneously. And it seems like the Indian domestic economy is more restrictive than ever before, which means, you know, all your, your import restrictions and export restrictions can't be that far behind uh, when, when the situation at home has now doubled down even more on the bets that Nehru made. Yeah. Now, you know, so uh, as we move forward uh, in time, uh, it's a, uh, one might ask a good question, you know, that uh, if it was around, say, 70, 1970 or a little later, uh, if, if the similar crisis were to happen, not in 66, but a little later, would Mrs. Gandhi have devalued? Uh, and my, yeah. my guess is that she wouldn't have. See, 66, 67, she is a very new prime minister. Yeah. Right. It's January 1966. Bal Shastri died uh, in yeah. Pashkan and she became the prime minister. Yeah. Uh, and, and so, you know, uh, at that time, she's still very weak prime minister, if you will. Uh, yeah. uh, you know, uh, uh, her own position is not so secure and all. Uh, uh, but then by 70s, of course, you know, she is the uh, 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 she is in uh, incredibly commanding uh, position. Uh, uh, so. Um, Probably, you know, at that point, she would have dealt with uh, uh, Lyndon Johnson very differently. <laughs> uh, <laughs> well, she but... would have dealt with Lyndon Johnson differently. But, you know, on the other hand, this is kind of, uh, it's it's a little bit strange. When people became, become very dictatorial, uh, then, you know, they may also take, uh, make bolder moves. So it's very difficult to predict the counterfactual when, when you have people in full dictatorial mode and have consolidated all power within their party and, you know, they're kind of ruling their cabinet. There's not too much opposition from their cabinet. So I, I feel like, you know, with, with Mrs. Gandhi, it could have easily gone the other way also. I'm, I'm never able to uh... predict. Yeah, the reason I, I, I say is that, you know, she, she was on, on very heavy socialist uh, yeah. uh, uh, bent, yeah. right? So so everything she was doing was, was moving yeah. towards more and more control. Yeah, so, and so Ian Huxer is, is think, right you know, now her chief advisor, and, and, and he yeah, really exactly. is following the Soviet exactly. Union playbook at this point. Exactly, exactly. So, so this is why I think, you know, that, she, that is the direction she would have taken. Uh, uh, you know the economy's direction is very clear at, uh, around this time. You know, so uh, and and so the clearly the uh, consistent thing to do would be to then re absolutely refuse to devalue uh, yeah. and just double down on the controls and double, double down, down on the down controls, on the controls. Which, yeah, which which they did. You know, which they did. Yeah. Um, and uh, FERA, uh, MRTP, everything becomes more restrictive, right? All these are also being yeah. amended simultaneously as the controls right, get heavier right. and heavier. More, more of the areas of activity are getting criminalized. It's becoming very difficult to do business internally and with players abroad if you're an Indian businessman uh, around that time. And then, of course, emergency happens. And that's sort of the wild card event that no one predicts. Uh, I imagine that, you know, until the mid-1975, as the restrictions get more and more uh, severe, and then the emergency when, you know, like the economy is almost in suspended play for a while, right? All major policy uh, is not being thought out carefully. So then we get to the late 70s, and you've talked about how starting in the late 70s up to 1991, there is definitely a period where India starts thinking about relaxing 
restrictions. And then, of course, you know, post-1991, we have like the really uh, very bold sort of reforms. So I think this is a nice place to end now. And then the next time you can you can walk us through the late 70s, early 80s period of what's happening in India? How are we thinking about relaxing these very severe restrictions? What is the impact that leads us up to the 91 reforms? I think so, yeah. But let me just you know, say one final thing that, uh, that this kind of uh, uh, controls, the very severe controlled regime that came to be uh, uh, had a major impact, you know? So, yeah. so one measure that we conventionally use, the imports to GDP ratio, yeah, that really declined steadily, you know, uh, yeah. uh, and uh, 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 you know, one way to think of it is that in the 1950s, uh, you know, imports never fell uh, below uh, five and a half percent of the GDP, right? And in fact, at peak in 57, 58, they were 9.3 percent of the GDP. So you know, uh, uh, roughly you can say between five and 10 percent. But by 1969-70, imports as a proportion of GDP had fallen to 4%. Yeah. And, 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 and a good part of it was probably also being spent at the time on food imports. So for yeah. the rest of it, you know, so you can imagine how industry had to function uh, because, you know, there's so many raw materials, immediate imports, et cetera, yeah. indeed, but uh, uh, nothing doing, you know. So, even you know till uh, 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 till almost uh, uh, mid seventies, you don't imports don't rise even to five percent. You know it, it's yeah. it's post mid seventies that uh, some expansion happens, and that's yeah. of course is is what we can discuss in the in the uh, next, next episode. Uh, yeah. you know, that uh, you know how I mean what are the factors that led to the some relaxation of the balance of payments constraint and so forth, which allowed for some bit of liberalization that, that happened uh, uh, beginning roughly the mid seventies. Mid seventies. Yeah, no, I think that's a, that's a great plan. And I'm excited because as we get closer and closer to the liberalization episode and also more recent in time, I think it starts becoming visible that everything ha happening in India today is so tightly linked uh, to you know some of the measures that were taken in the 80s and 90s so i'm i'm yes. i'm really looking Maybe. forward to that discussion but thank you so much arvind it's always a pleasure likewise good thank you shruti